This is the Word Welders podcast, all about the world of writing and writers. If you write, read, or just stream movies and TV, Word Welders is for you. We open a window into the workings of the writer's mind. Each episode explores how writers find ideas, where they get their creative spark, and what drives them to plunge into the realms of imagination. Whether fact, fiction, fantasy, drama, or comedy, it starts with a writer. And we're going to hear from the source in the Word Welders podcast. I'm your host, Scott Moss. Welcome to the very first episode of Word Welders, Writers on Forging Imagination. For our premiere episode, we're going to dive into the world of comedy. And today's guest is someone I know very well as a writer, a stand-up comic, an actor, my wife, Gailey Moss. Gail, welcome to Word Welders, and congratulations on being our very first guest. Well, I sort of made you have me, but I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Scott. And you're very welcome. We're thrilled to have you here, and uh, we're especially interested in delving into um, the comedic mind and how that affects both the writing process and uh, the process in attempting to write stand-up comedy, which a lot of people don't feel is scripted. So this isn't really a question, but um, I want to ask if you remember our second date. Um, We went to a bookstore, both of us meandering in different directions, and found ourselves both meeting up in the writing slash movies slash TV section. Was that it for you? Did you know you found your own true love? Well, I sort of had a hint when you said we were going to go to a bookstore on a date. So... I was kind of kind of taken aback by that, and I, I thought that was very interesting. Had anyone ever asked you on a first date to a bookstore before? No. No, they had not. Uh, so when we went in, I was a little bit nervous, so I wanted to go directly to the Smarty book section so that you would think that I was as smart as you are. And so I headed directly for the really hard crosswords, history books. I think I knew that even then that you really liked history. And I snuck a thesaurus into my purse just so I could impress you later. Oh, there you go. So today I want to start with the writing process and ask about writing itself. When you first dreamed of writing and when did you think, wow, this is what I want to do with my life? Well, I first dreamed of writing very young. Um, In school, I would write a lot of really creative notes and I got in a lot of trouble. But every once in a while, I'd see the teacher kind of snicker. And that was a big hook for me. So in the sixth grade, I was an all-star first baseman. I read books about um, Pete Rose, Charlie Hustle, The Big Red Machine. I had an autographed bat from um, Ken Griffin, senior, not junior, Ken Griffey. And um, I was also into writing the notes and little short stories and things like that. And I was always reading the little short stories in the Reader's Digest that my mom subscribed to, the little funny stories. So at the end of sixth grade, uh, we had a little graduation ceremony, and I was voted most likely to become the first female professional baseball player. That did not work out for me. And also voted most likely to become a writer. Still working on that one, but much more likely than the baseball situation. So if writing hadn't worked out baseball was it for you that was um baseball was it until the seventh grade when I saw Dean Colosimo walking down the hallway and then I forgot all about baseball uh and just really started thinking about boys who play baseball (laughs) (laughs) okay um and then I wrote him a cute little note oh well there you go I hope it was very creative writing So for many of us, um, there's a crucial book, author, TV show, or movie that really kind of made us begin to imagine about the creators behind the scenes and the stories. Do you have a touchstone moment, book, person as you look back? When I look back, I remember um, Irma Bombeck. So I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and Irma Bombeck was from Dayton, and she wrote these little little stories, little funny antidotes that went in the newspaper. 
And one time, she, well, several times, she was on Good Morning America. And I could not believe that somebody from Ohio was on Good Morning America. So one of the first, um, I don't know, I guess adult books that I read, let me rephrase that, grown-up books <laughs> that I read was um, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, Why Do I Get All the Pits? That spoke to me. That spoke to me. And went on to read The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. Being a suburbs kid, I could relate to that. So I really, really sort of um, got some of my humor cues from Irma Bombeck. I really loved her. And Carol Burnett, I I loved Carol Burnett. She was my Saturday night babysitter. I, I loved her. And you may remember the time that we got to see Carol Burnett in California. I do. I remember uh, security being involved in that incident somehow. Right. Well, you know, when you go up to get your book signed and you begin to cry harder and harder and harder and profusely tell Carol how much you loved her, then security comes just to make sure everything's okay. So that was, it was awkward, but I did get her autograph. So I'm, gl- I'm glad you brought up the comedy influences because that, of course that's where you, you found your, your jam, so to speak. And there's this old maxim that, you know, dying's easy, comedy is hard. What as a writer and comedian is the most difficult part about comedy? Well, you know, everyone says comedy is timing, and that is very much true. Um, and it is also really about knowing your audience. Like, um, for instance, you don't want to be dropping F-bombs at the church social. You don't want to do that. Um, but you don't want to be telling street jokes or dad jokes, if you will, at the comedy club. You know, so know your audience, look out there, read them, see who's out there um, and sort of tailor your stuff in the moment, if you can, to who's in the audience. And then and then it comes back to timing and really confidence, um, which is one of the things I struggled with on stage is confidence. But you really have to sell it. And if 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 you believe it's funny, somebody out there will. Okay, so let's take that on as a moment. Uh, you've been on some of the biggest comedic stages in the world. Um, you did bring up the comedy store. You've performed there. Yes. How is that experience, and what stands out looking back on facing an audience in a venue like that? Uh, sheer fear, absolute fear. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're in the green room, which, by the way, is black at the comedy store, and you're waiting for them to call your name and it's absolute fear and terror. And you go out there and you try to be confident and sell them and get their attention and talk over the waiters and all that. But, um, it can be difficult. It takes practice. And I think if I'd have started when I was a little younger, um, you know, cause you're fearless when you're young, it might've been better. But I, I think the first time I was on stage at the comedy store, I, I was 48. I think, and I knew just enough to be dangerous. So it, it was frightening. But um, and if I remember correctly, I bombed pretty bad. But I don't remember that, but I do remember sitting in the audience and and watching this strange look come over your face as the cord to your microphone came disconnected. Yes, I it fell out of the bottom of my microphone probably because I was shaking so hard, and I just stood there like a deer in headlights and. Pretty soon it occurred to me to bend over and pick it up and plug it back in. But I think that took 37 hours. It felt like 37 hours. Was it that long? It was not. Oh, sure felt like that. So you brought up timing, tailoring your material to your audience, and you're at a venue like the Comedy Store. So we're switching lanes now as the writer side other than the performer. How do you approach your writing process for creating that material for a venue like that. And also, because you've written numerous screenplays and TV pilots, what comes first to you, the idea, or do you just sit in front of a blank screen and just hope for this flash of inspiration? I never, ever, ever sit in front of a blank screen because it leads to drinking. So I never do that. Usually (laughs) I will get an idea. Sometimes I'll get a title, and I have built... Uh, an entire book around a title. Um, Sometimes it's a character. 
my my one the comedy I was doing for a while was based on a half hour pilot that I was writing called Rollington Rollington.com and uh, it was about my time as a used car salesman in LA so that was interesting so I I wrote the um, the half hour comedy pilot and I thought to myself oh this is how I'm gonna sell that pilot I'm gonna get out there on the comedy stage and do bits from um, the pilot and I, you know, I changed them around and everything. I just wasn't going to go up there and read the script. But for instance, um, I would have myself introduced as a woman that would get in a car with anyone. And I would tell people, I will get in a car with you, 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 pick people out of the audience. And I would, I would say, and it's not because I'm a hooker. It's worse. I'm a used car salesman. <laughs> so I usually would get the audience in there with you because they wondered, why would she get in a car with me? And then I would tell bits from things that happen um, in in the uh, in the script. Small detour, selling used cars, Burbank. You run across a lot of celebrities. Yes, several of, several of them hit the part hit the lot. Um, who did you most try to talk into a test drive? <laughs> um, gosh, well. It, you know, it was kind of hit or miss who you got and who the Sharks beat you to. Uh, I think the guy that I most tried to talk into a test drive was not really a celebrity maybe outside of L.A. His name is Dallas Rains. It still is Dallas Rains, and he's a weatherman in L.A. And I was flying through the showroom, and I saw him, and I stopped dead in my track, and I said, you're, you're, you're. And he reached his hand out, and he goes, I'm Dallas Rains. And I was, I was just and like, and you said, "Of course you are. Of course you are." <laughs> and and uh, so I tried to get him out, and um, we got into a, a, I think I believe it was a Porsche. I think, yeah, I, th I think so. Anywho, I couldn't figure out how to start the car because the button is on the left. Anyway, so he had to show me how to start the car. So that was embarrassing, and needless to say, he did not buy it. But. Um, there were several other uh, celebrity sightings, and I was always amazed. Like, I saw Sherry O'Terry in there, and I was like, oh, my God, Sherry O'Terry. And I kind of slobbered all over her and Sean Hayes and, um, gosh, just people that you would be surprised. But I guess maybe sometimes they were buying them for their assistance. Well, they need a car as much as anybody else. This is true. This is true. And Especially the, in L.A. In L.A., the used car lot that I worked at was in Burbank. So, I mean, we had used Porsches, and uh, we had a Mustang Shelby. I think that's what it was called, right? That one I almost drove through the plate glass because it really goes, really, really goes. So. All right. So uh, even our friends that are more familiar with your work um, may not realize that the back of your head's been on primetime television more than probably anyone that I know of. Um, you've done a lot of background work on TV, and I, I seem to recall at one point during our California sojourn, you were on primetime television four times in a single week. What's that experience like, and, and how did you leverage those appearances to, to push your writing on poor and suspecting producers? Well, one of the reasons I started doing background was to try to meet people because I think it only pays $9 an hour, and there is a hierarchy on set. There's A-list actors, B-list actors, day players. Uh, there's um, union background, and then there's background background, which is what I was, and we are low man, the lowest of the low. So, yes, it usually was the back of my head that was on TV, but I was on network television four nights in a row at one point. You know, and I've been told that I do look better walking away. <laughs> so um, I would just, you know, there's there were rules. You couldn't take pictures. You, you couldn't speak to, especially an A-lister, unless spoken to. Don't even try to talk to the director. Um, you just go where you go. You eat after everybody else eats. Um, you're low man. But I would sneak around. I would sneak around. Um, one time, uh, I think it was, was it Screen Gems? I think it was Screen Gems. We were on lunch break from doing a sitcom. Um, 
And I snuck in an elevator behind somebody and went up to the second floor. And I went up to the lady at the desk. And I just started pitching her, elevator pitching her, even though I wasn't on the elevator anymore. And she goes, how did you get in here? And I told her. And she goes, I like your chutzpah. I don't think she said chutzpah, but basically. And she took my script. You know, so naturally I was calling everyone and telling them that I'm famous now. And then she passed on my script. But I thought, wow, that's a great story. And one day I will tell it on a podcast. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so one last question. Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up our uh, our episode here. But because of your California experiences, you've been celebrity adjacent so many times over your career. What one person or moment stands out and why? Well, there were lots of them. A lot of the celebrities, um, if you happen to get past, uh, you know, the the PAs, the production assistants and stuff that are guarding them, are really nice people. A couple of them have even agreed to read my scripts. Um, a couple of them have said, boy, I would do this if you got it produced. That's the tricky part is getting it produced. Yeah, I seem to recall Dennis Haysbert uh, saying he was very interested in a, in a part that you practically created for him and he just he thought you already had production lined up right well I didn't actually get to speak to him I I spoke with his manager but uh she said he read it he liked it and call him when it was ready to be produced and I and I said oh I thought you would produce it you live and you learn right but I mean I had many experiences on set um where they were really nice and really helpful. So let's let's change up the question a little bit then, and I, I don't think any of these people are probably going to listen to our podcast yet because we're not famous. Not yet. But um, do you have a favorite? A favorite experience on... Or, or just a favorite celebrity that you have interacted with. Oh, well, that's Carol Burnett. I mean, I love her. I adore her. Uh, but I have had some really good interactions, and... Um, I've met nice people sneaking in offices. I, I, snuck, in, I snuck into Clint Eastwood's production offices. Um, that one didn't go as well, but you have hope. And I was so hoping he would just walk by or something. But he, didn't, he didn't say, go ahead, kid, make my day. He, I didn't even see him. <laughs> didn't see him. Oh, um, oh, one of my good stories is I, I snuck into Happy Madison, which is uh, Adam... Uh, Sandberg's production company. Sandler. Sandler. Oh, my gosh. I'm, well, see, I, I worked with Andy Sandberg once, too. But anywho, so I sneak in there. Well, I just walked in like I was supposed to be there. And the guy in the lobby goes, oh, they're upstairs. And I was like, hot dog. So I went upstairs, went in, dropped off my scripts. And I was like, you know, okay, call me, whatever. Left, went back to set because if you're late coming back from set, they don't pay you. Um so I get a call about 20 minutes later on set. It vibrated because, you know, you can't have your phone out. And they were like, uh, who are you? <laughs> and why is the script here? And we can't keep it. And I was like, well, if you keep it, I'll sign a release. I'll, I'll come right down now and sign a release. And I signed the release. And then I got a very nice no thank you from them. In fact, one of, well, you'll remember the time. We had gone away for the weekend, and we got a notification that we had a certified mail waiting for us from um, William Morris Agency. I do remember That's that. That's one of those times when I thought, this is it. I'm moving on up. It was a certified mail. They made me sign for my rejection letter. That one stung. That stung. That does. That, that's, that's, so. a little, that's a little cold. Yeah. You know, though, um, just to go back to our second date, when we finally worked around and we met in the um, screenplay section... And I think you, you even bought me a book by Sid. What was Sid? I, I did. I bought Screenwriting by Sid Field. You sure did. Thank you. So who knew that all these years later? But uh, that's when I was like, oh, this one, this one's a keeper. This guy's good. So, um, and I'd like to tell another little story about you just really quick. You know how you were asking me about what made me decide to finally be a writer yes well I'd been working in banks for years as you know and occasionally I would come home with a cardboard box and you'd say what happened and I think it was a little more than occasionally but we yeah. won't we won't uh, so this one belabor that point <laughs> this one particular 
Friday, I came home with my cardboard box and you said, what happened? And I said, well, they promoted me. So I quit. I, do. I remember that. You, those were your exact words, yeah. as a matter of fact. And you said, well, what is it that you'd like to do? This was, oh gosh, was this 16 or 17 years ago? You said, what is it that you'd like to do? And I said, I want to write. And you said, well, why don't you quit talking about it? And I think I produced a uh, the 321. Remember 321? I remember that. I think I did that in a week because you found me a writing contest, the New York Television Film Festival. And you said, this, this, uh, they need a, they need a pilot in a week for this contest. And I wrote it in a week. I remember that. You know why? Because I didn't know that you're not supposed to do that. So that's why I would say to all the writers out there, don't know that you're not supposed to do that and just do it. Right. Very good. So that kind of goes against the grain of you have to know the rules before you break the rules, but um, sometimes breaking the rules works out. Well, I, I still agree with that. Know the rules so you know how to break the rules. But um, be leery of the screenwriting groups. Some of them are good. Some of them are, are bad. You'll remember one particular entire rewrite I did because they said you were not supposed to use INGs in a screenplay. And then you'll remember that screenwriters conference we went to when John August, and he's doing all right. He knows what he's talking about. He said, I use INGs all the time. So be leery of your screenwriting groups and uh, the Karens in the groups that'll tell you what they know. But. And I think that's a great way to end. Watch out for Karens, everybody, no matter what you do. This has been Word Welders. We want to thank Gilly Moss for being our very first guest at our very first episode. And we ask you all to please join us again on our next episode when we're going to delve into the world of academic writing. I know you all can't wait for that. So thank you for listening. Thanks for having me, Scott.